So this afternoon, we wanted to address the topic of power of authentic compassion. A few days back when I was in Nubandav and I was giving a class on compassion. And also in our Beggar 3 book, we have this wonderful meditation on accessing greater uh, compassion. And we were particularly looking directly at how Krishna is so, so compassionate. And so we shared many ways, uh, many pastimes of Krishna's interactions where he is so much concerned, so much expressing his, his compassion of how he even cries in relationship to some of the things that his devotees uh, experience. You know, sometimes Krishna is crying out of their difficulties, austerities, etc. Sometimes he is crying out of his great uh, ecstatic uh, expressions in association with the devotees, and on and on. So we wanted to look a little closer. And then after that, I saw Satsu Maharaj's book. It's a really nice book out, some of the nice books, but another nice book uh, on compassion. And I want to read one of the things from that. But we want to look at authentic, the power of authentic compassion. Let, let me ask you first, you can share with us before I start uh, my explanation. When you think of someone who is, who is compassionate, what, what impressions come to you? What, what things do you reflect and think about when you consider or reflect on someone being a compassionate person? What's some of the attributes, characteristics what, what comes to your, your consciousness? Understanding. Yes. Understanding. Uh -huh. I have a pretty nice definition of compassion. It is when you are expecting, demanding the most from someone while understanding what they want. Demanding the most from someone while understanding what they're going through. It's very nice. Empathy. Empathy. Patience. Patience. Uh -huh. When you think of someone, as being a compassionate person. Yes? Uh huh. Putting another's welfare first. Putting, putting another's welfare first. Mm -hmm. In the dictionary, yes, you can share also. Loving, yes. English dictionary gives also interesting reference to compassion is that having s empathy or sympathy. Having sympathy towards someone while trying to do things to help, help that person. So having sympathy, being aware of someone's problem, issue, concern, but not just only cognizance of being uh, attentive or aware, but also doing things, doing something to see how to relieve that person from their suffering, their inconvenience, from their bewilderment, or assist someone in some goal, etc. So it has these two interesting aspects of attentiveness or awareness, cognizance, while at the same time some activity that is in relationship or corresponds with that awareness. So if, if we're not uh, aware, sensitive to the environment or to others, it will be hard to, to be compassionate. And if we are not also uh, arranging or doing something that assists in someone's well-being, then it becomes hard to be compassionate. And we're going to address a probably even more important theme, or as important, is that it is extremely hard or literally impossible to be compassionate if one is not having facility, power, ability to help to make some improvement or some change. So much of what we'll share as part of the underlining theme is that in order to be authentically compassionate, it means to be sensitive, 
literally monitoring, being uh, mindful. It means to strategize, reflect, and see what one can do to be able to bring some greater sense of well-being or some facilitation. And it also means that one has some ability, some facility to be able to, to make a difference. So we cannot really be authentically compassionate if we can't also do something to make some trans, transformation. Because much of compassion comes out when you are looking at people's needs or your own needs. Because we also want to first see how to be compassionate with ourselves. As we are compassionate with ourselves, as we have power, facility, resources with our, within our own grasp, then we have ability to be able to extend, to share, to, to help, help someone else. But if we do not have some power for transformation for ourselves, we cannot be genuinely compassionate with ourselves. If we don't have some power, some facility, some resources that we can extend, then we can't actually be compassionate with others. We can have some sympathy, but compassion goes beyond sympathy. It, it means caring and also doing something. It means caring and then involving oneself so that it is addressing the well-being of another. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's, good, it's good concern, it's, it's sentimentalism. Good intentions uh, are there. There's an interesting description Satsuma Maharaj gives you looking in, at Sanskrit dictionary and some of the ways that it addresses compassion. Some of the words, for instance. First is anu kampana, which means sympathy, anugraha, kindness, favoring one, conferring benefits upon others, promoting good objectives or being gracious toward others. Karuna, as we say a devotee is Tatikshava Karuniga, is merciful, is kind, is compassionate, is tolerant. Means, uh, directly means compassion. Kripa, compassion ex uh, accompanied by, uh, by tenderness or by kindness. It often means pity. It especially uh, refers to compassion towards those who, who one knows. So it means compassion based on one's field of activities. People, one knows someone else's issues and then is putting energy in trying to help. Daya, widespread or generalized feelings of mercy or it's, it's sympathy. And daya is also expressed, it's one of the uh, secondary, secondary rasas. We have the primary rasas and we have the secondary. And the second, and this secondary ras is particularly in connection also with, with Vatsalya, you see it particularly very dominant, or, or the parental ras, where one is feeling that if they don't arrange for Krishna's care, that Krishna will suffer. And so the daya emphasizes one feeling paternalistic, or feeling a distinct mood to try to be, a, be, the, be the caretaker, considering that the other party is, is in need, and realizing that one can play a role in helping to facilitate those needs. And we know this is a, one of the deeper expressions in God, in God consciousness, in Krishna consciousness, because to just see the Lord in terms of servitude, of seeing God as the autocrat, the Aishvara, the supreme controller, maintainer, annihilator, then there is reverence, but there's not so much the element of compassion as it is 
when one is thinking of the Lord as, a, as like a friendship or in paternal, etc. And so there is then more of a demand for the individual to be fully present, more of a demand to render service, more of a demand to be aware of what is needed and to see how one can play a role to facilitate those needs. But keep in mind, when there is a need, it means there is now an opportunity to arrange something, an opportunity to give something, an opportunity to share something, an opportunity to, to experience some things. And so it involves this type of, of some bundle or relationship that sends a, like, it, 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 it's, it's a wake-up call, or it, it elicits an opportunity to, to be able to connect. But now, if there's, if there's not power, there's not resources, if there's not facility, then one's compassion is just a matter of only well-wishing. Compassion is more than just wishing one well, or wishing oneself well, but it's wishing with some, some uh, action or facilitation. What is the difference between spiritual compassion and humanism? We see there's a philosophy of humanism some people are humanitarians. Often, that is not the same as spiritual compassion. What's a, what's a major difference between what we would call spiritual compassion and uh, humanism? Anyone? Yes. Mark, uh. Yeah, humanitarianism, humanism, it, it often is just relegated only uh, to the body, uh, but not addressing the, the soul. What else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, humanism can often mean uh, how you're okay, how, am I okay how, how I'm okay, or how we're not okay, but how we want to be okay. But it doesn't really uh, ne necessitate involving God, involving Krishna. It doesn't necessitate involving the Lord, nor does it really necessitate involving the highest expression or the highest aspect of the individual. It doesn't really have to address the soul. It doesn't have to address the nature of the soul, the ultimate destiny of the soul doesn't have to address the ultimate union of the soul. And so when we talk about compassion, we're, we're talking about something, authentic compassion, beyond just trying to uh, engage in fixing something so that it works better or to increase the situation where one continues to suffer with less obstacles or less interferences. It doesn't mean keeping the person in the same condition where the future means likelihood for the same or more t types, of, types of suffering. But it's about giving real sense of nourishment that goes beyond, of course, the mind, the intelligence, the body, uh, and the senses. For instance, there is, well, Papa gives an interesting example here about the boils, how some one can have oil and you can blow on it. But blowing on it, there is cognizance that there is some infection, some disturbance, some sickness. But there is not proper facilitation to make a difference. So while we have real compassion, it, it makes a difference. And one has the facilities to be able to make the difference. Here in a room conversation, Papa says, the first of all, you understand you have to die. 
If I think, oh, you should not die, so what, my, what may this compassion, how will it help? You have to die. Then what is the use of this compassion? If you give him something, then he will die. That is, is that real compassion? Suppose that there's a boil, a boil here. I am suffering, and you come. Oh, you are suffering. Is that compassion? What you feel pain, in, uh, I guess saying. Papa says, you feel, but what is the meaning of that feeling? You cannot do anything. The guest says, no, it is not possible. Papa says, so this kind of compassion also is useless. It is wasted. Emphasizing that the boil is there, you blow on it, or you say, oh, you're suffering with this. But, yeah, that's sympathy, but that's not authentic compassion because it hasn't brought resources, facilitation, to, to make a difference. And so it's, it's sentimental. A person may feel a little better in knowing that you know that I'm suffering, you know that I'm in need, you know that I'm in pain, you know that I have sickness. And so that, that's the beginning. Worse if a person to be in such a state and see others are not concerned. But obviously to be concerned and to help to make a difference is a real sense of, sense of authentic compassion. Uh, Prabhupada gives in Bhagavad Gita how material compassion is actually incomplete. This is Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, verse 1. Sanya uvatya tam tarha kripaya vishtam asru pranakule sanam visiradam idam vakyam uvatya madhu sadanam. Translation. Sanjaya said, see Arjun full of compassion, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears. Madhu Sadhana Krishna spoke the following words. Uh, uh, this is purport, Prabhupada giving. Material compassion, lamentation, and tears are all signs of ignorance, of the real self. Compassion for the eternal soul is self-realization. The word Madhu Sadhana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon, Madhu, and now Arjuna wanted Krishna to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had taken him in the discharge of his duty. No one knows where compassion should be applied. Compassion for the dress of a drowning man is useless. Since a man fallen in the ocean of nations cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress. Gross material body, which is of course the outward dress, one who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called a sudra or who laments unnecessarily. So here we're looking at useless compassion, uh, material compassion, sentiment that really doesn't make a full change because it doesn't access power, it doesn't bring resources, facilitation to be able to make a genuine uh, difference. Now, some time back, and the devotees are working with the uh, uh, ISKCON TV, put an a, uh, excerpt of a survey that was done some time back. And the survey was evaluating different places around the world, different communities, societies. And it was trying to address where are people most happy? Some of you may have heard of that or remember the excerpt in the, in the video. And one of the places that was mentioned where people were, were most happy was in the villages in Bengal and also in America, uh, the Amish communities. Now, if we think about that for a minute. If we, we analyze, we see that most people are not. For instance, in the case of the simple people in Bengal, what we'll find is that they did not have so much. But they had a sense of complacency within themselves, and they had a sense of security or a sense of being fed that they are valued because they're living in the village, living in a community where each person has a role and responsibility within the environment. Happy. People who are not happy, who have so many things, 
You just think about it for a little while. Think about people who you may know or may know of who, who have so many things, but they're not happy. But also think of people who have very little, who also are not happy. And then you think of people who have the basic things, and still most of them are also not happy. So you begin to wonder, what is going on? Well, to take yourselves and reflect on, if you may, times that you really felt most happy. Times in your life when you could say that you were at a high point in your happiness. If we had more time, we could look at this much closer through more uh, sharing uh, dialogue. But if you think about this, for you and for others, certain things are distinct when you find yourself or when you reflect on when you were most happy. Hopefully it's, it's now. But some, some things are going on. Let me try to identify some of those things. That's probably universal to most people. Some of the things that's going on is that you feel good about what's happening to you. You feel something good about what you are doing to others or doing with others. You feel good that somehow others are helping you to feel valued. You feel good that you yourself are feeling valued. There is some level of adventure in your life, some level of risk and anticipation based on something that is already happening. In other words, if you really think about it, your mind and everybody's happiness doesn't distinctly deal with the fact that there are many opulences, many material things, or that there is void of material things. It doesn't have to necessarily do with the geographical environment. That may be a variable, but not necessarily. But it surely has to do with your perception of yourself and others' perception of you and how you're interpreting others' perceptions. I just had an interesting conversation this week with someone who is actually quite, one of our devotees, who's actually quite successful with finance, with resources, with power and influence, but very disappointed and unhappy because others are not sending that signal to the person that, that you're okay. We know many people, or have heard of many people, who seemingly have made it in some of achievement of success, but who have some low self-esteem within themselves because either of how they are evaluating their own selves or how they are thinking others are giving them. You see somebody who is somewhat happy and they may or may not have many commodities, they may or may not have many achievements, they may or may not have many resources, they may have a lot of things that are not even going so well. But if they have great sense of value within themselves, and if somehow they are getting some reciprocation somewhere from others that's also giving them value, then in spite of whatever other stuff is there, there's a certain level of happiness. In other words, happiness has much more to do with what the internal constitutional state of things are within oneself. And also how with that same internal constitution, one is seeing what others are thinking, doing, arranging, etc. How we codify that. So, and for each person's existence has meaning for others. We take the Amish, they have rejected a lot of things that people look toward for having well-being. But there's something deeper there than just the external and physicalities. Some of them have wealth, a lot of properties and whatnot, 
but many don't. But whether they do or don't, there's an interesting factor that's there, is that they see within themselves a sense of well-being. They're experiencing a sense of well-being from others, because each person's existence is so much also locked into what is shared and what is experienced amongst, amongst the family, amongst, amongst the community. And so even though one may not have much, it's like we've heard how at a certain uh, age, the Amish allow their children to leave. But somewhere the statistics over 80, 85 percent, maybe even higher, that they don't leave. Or if they do leave, they come back. And one of the reasons is because no sane person wants to leave a community where the community can offer more than what they can get to by themselves, or the community can offer more than what they could find elsewhere. So when they realize being in a different environment, there's more struggle for existence, there's less support, there's less aid, there's less comfort solace when there's something wrong or something that isn't right, and they realize how much they have within the simplicity, then many people, most children, they come back or they stay. Now what we see that's facilitating this happiness, or what facilitates authentic compassion, which is also connected with happiness for oneself and for one extends to others, is we see cognizance of other persons while also some resources or some facility to be able to do something. When you look at when you were most happy, it wasn't when you were in a position where you felt that you had no influence, no power. It wasn't when a time when you were in a situation where you felt others who also had influence or had power had no interest or concern for you. It was the opposite. It wasn't necessarily when you had so much or when you didn't have any. It had a lot to do with what was going on internally with your perception of you and how you saw others feeding into your existence. And so what Prabhupada is giving an example about the boil. So there is sympathy toward a issue. But Prabhupada says that is not real compassion. Or not Jun was being bewildered and there was genuine reason to be bewildered. He was having to confront people who were quite dear to him. But Krishna is speaking to him, trying to help him to understand the nature of the soul and also to understand the nature of consequence and the importance of doing one's duty, but also the nature uh, of, the, of life, the nature of interactions, the nature of results, of what consequences bring about, and what he could do and why he should do his duty. So Krishna was letting him understand. It is not just so healthy to have sympathy or to be concerned. First be concerned and then use that for cognizance to act, to do something that will help. So Krishna shows him how to do what will ultimately be, uh, be most, most beneficial. So if we think about that, is that we are most happy when we feel good about ourselves. But notice, nobody's really happy in just having something or feeling good if they are not able to do something with that. So many people, millionaires, millionaires, billionaires, very popular, have this opulence, et cetera, et cetera, who are miserable, they have power, they have resources. But at the same time, they're either not feeling good about themselves or they're not feeling that others are giving that good feeling to them. So it is very much connected with compassion, that it's about being aware and now making a difference with facilita facilities that one has, as one is uh, sharing or extending that to, uh, to others. So we want to look a little closer at a few reflections. We're looking at useless compassion should not just be based on sentiment. It cannot just be based only on the material. See, sometimes as devotees, we 
minimize the mode of goodness, or we look at sack of caring if it's only the body and we play it down. Well, yeah, there's something definitely not so wonderful when compassion is only directed toward the body. But I think compassion should address the whole person. It should not only address the soul. Reflect on that also. Because we are not just interacting as the Atma. We have a body, we have a mind, we have an intelligence, and we have senses. And at this time, unfortunately, we have certain material and psychological and even emotional needs. We've had the experience of someone saying, oh, just chant Hare Krishna. Or someone saying, you're not the body. That is not an expression of compassion. Because it is not taking the full person uh, in account. Nor is it accessing one's own for humanity. We're not souls interacting with other souls and that's it. That is our ultimate condition. We're fully spiritual entities in essence. But we are spiritual entities now undergoing material experiences, but those material experiences is part of our field of activities, is part of our test that we're taking, is part of our unfoldment. We do not want anyone to treat us only if we are spiritual entities. I don't care who you are. You will not be happy if somebody treats you only as you are spirit soul. At the same time, you as transcendentalists will not be happy if somebody is treating you only if you are that gender, that race, that ethnic group, that particular age group, etc. Because you know that you are more than that. You are that plus. And so this one authentic compassion looks at who you really are as well as what you are presently, when most of all what you're trying to become, and helps to facilitate that, especially who you are trying to become. But how do we help someone to become something if we're not accepting where they are? How do we help somebody to be something if we're not connecting with them to help them with the growth process? How do we help somebody to grow if we're not growing? How do we help somebody to advance if we're not advancing? How do we give something if we don't have it ourselves? It, it is sentiment. It's not real compassion. Here, uh, Sathya Mahārāj writes, and he's speaking about a conversation that Prabhupāda had in Mayapur. As devotees aspire to practice Krishna consciousness throughout our entire lives, the ability to be compassionate toward ourselves seems necessary. For example, we actually have to save ourselves first before we can hope to save anyone else. Let me read that again. We have actually to save ourselves first before we can hope to save anyone else. Srila Prabhupada spoke in the, in the room conversation in Mayapur. This is a quote from Prabhupada. To save them from being washed away by Maya, if we become washed away, then where is the hope? Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Janma sarhaka kari kara para upakara. Be strong so that you may not be a rascal. And then, then you can do. Otherwise, it will be impossible. How is it possible? A man is drowning. If you are strong enough, you can save. But if you also become drowned, then how you will save him. So everything is there. Save yourself, save others. This is our Krishna conscious movement. First of all, first of all, save yourself. Then try to save others. Or both things can go simultaneously. The same example, if you want to save somebody who is drowning, you must know that I may not be washed away. I have to remain strong and I can save him. It's a room conversation in Mayapur, February the 14th, uh, 19, 
77, emphasizing uh, foremost, get oneself fixed up. Have some facility, have some uh, strategy, have some plan, have some focus, and now reach out. Or reach out while you're developing focus, but don't try to reach out, don't try to help if in fact you are not, have helped yourself first or not helping yourself uh, simultaneously. Otherwise, it will, it will be uh, a sentimental affair. Here, uh, Prabhupada, for instance, he sometimes would just speak about abortion, sometimes about cows, and he would start tearing. Now, was he being sentimental? Was he just empathizing? He was being he was expressing sympathy, he was expressing empathy. But even more than that, he was sharing about the problem and also giving knowledge and understanding and arranging to do something to address the problem. So he's doing something to address the problem while not just only looking at the fact that there is spirit soul. Because first, if in the fact there was spirit soul, then he would remain on the ultimate platform where there is no ability, facilitation to preach, no reason to preach. But we see that even such great devotees allow themselves to come down to the second class level or to the majam level because they are reaching in or reaching out to connect more with our psyches and then to see how to help. Can you really help somebody if you don't know what their problem is? Can you really help somebody if you don't know their pain? Can you help somebody if you don't know where they are and where you want to help to bring them to? You can give all kinds of medication. If you don't understand the disease, you don't know the, the or gravity of the disease, then it is just conjecture, speculation, sentimentalism, etc. So here Prabhupada is speaking about these issues and even cheering so much emotion and concern about the well-being and then so much action to see how to help. Just as you have someone you care about, your children or whatever, your husband, your wife, or anyone, you see them suffering or think of their suffering, you start thinking and start arranging for some way to help. Child is crying, the mother knows the, 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 the voice of her child. She hears that child crying and immediately she gets active. Now, to do something. She don't know what, but she's there to try to see what is the issue and how she can be able to eradicate the problem fully, or at least to be able to minimize it. Real sense of authentic compassion. Attention, cognizance, awareness, and then some facilitation. There cannot be facilitation without awareness and without some direction of resources and of power. When she the I went to the Morning Star a Ranch, that's the ranch where uh, people were practicing some kind of spirituality, but they were acting more like, uh, like animals. Uh, they were in the nude, living in trees, etc. And here, Siddha Prabhupada, a resident of the spiritual world, coming not only to the mature world and to hellish environments, but going to a place where people are so far away from authentic spirituality. But with compassion, and concern, he, he went there and then tried to or address some issues of genuine spirituality. And some devotees, several senior devotees came uh, out of that particular community. Some, some time back, uh, many years ago, when we had just started the institute some time back, I remember once a relative of Rajalila's came I think it was her aunt and a cousin or something. And I had a chance to speak with her in the room. Had a nice conversation. She was somewhat skeptical about the movement. We spoke. I thought the conversation was nice. I hope it helped her to think better about the movement. Now, after she left my room, I closed the door. Just as I closed the door, she was going down the steps, and she stumbled. 
She tripped in steps. She actually hurt herself somewhat. Not serious, but she, she, she hurt herself. Now, when she tripped down the stairs, I heard it. And I started reflecting. Uh, maybe I act like I didn't hear it. Uh, after I'm a I should be touching women. I don't even touch devoted women. I just about calming women. Uh, other people take care of her. Uh, I just had this very sort of ethereal conversation with her. Let, let's let everything stay at that level. I made all kinds of rationalizations in like a minute and a half. And it wasn't authentic compassion. Because in the process of rationalizing based on so-called transcendence, after all, it's probably her karma. After all, it's probably Krishna chastising her for having ill will toward devotees. <laughs> so she just saw the guru and sannyasi, and now she's getting a quick chastise. I mean, different things, you know? But that wasn't genuine compassion. Just to say, well, she's not the body, or somebody else is going to take care of her, or it's out of my hands, or it's out of my ashram. It wasn't thinking about what is the best way for facilitating her based on the fact that she is a spiritual entity who also has a spiritual body, who also is a prisoner of the material world. What can be done to help that person to come closer to being freed from the prison? It's like we know that violence is not just a matter of physical assault, but it's a matter of anything that doesn't add to one's Krishna consciousness, doesn't add to facilitating one's liberation and ultimate shavya or service to Krishna. So it would have been wrong for me only to be concerned about her physicality, but it would also have been wrong for me only to be concerned about the fact that she's a spiritual entity. It would have been right for me to be concerned that she is in a physical body and she's in need and maybe in some pain. And also to understand by rendering some service, by being concerned, I bring myself in consciousness to be able to also to help her in such a way that it would help her in her advancement or enfoldment in spiritual life. The opposite happened. Up to this day, that lady has some ill feeling toward Krishna consciousness because she thought, one of the leaders of Krishna consciousness, I failed and need to come and help. Hmm? So in the thinking of transcendent so-called ashram strictures, formalities and etiquette, I had a chance to really to put ice on the cake, really facilitating what I share with her in the preaching so that she could really be able to take full advantage because we know Acharya Van Purusha Veda, Acharya, or we see a Pracha, Acharya and Pracha. Our actions and our speech are similar, especially our actions. We should want to come to a level in our devotion we don't even have to talk so much. Sometimes people, they ask me lately, you know, what's the vision you have for Gita Nagui community? There were times when I would have said, oh, I want to see Varnashram Dharma, I want to see self-sufficiency, I want to see cottage industries. Yes, all of those things is secondary. What we would like to see is an environment where whatever's going on, people are seeing Krishna. That whatever is happening, people are accessing Krishna. I'd like to see an environment where, in general, devotees have constant skills, conflict resolution skills to facilitate themselves, facilitate movement, a life based on simplicity, based on the heart connections. But most important, whether we have a lot, develop a lot, or have nothing, that there is an environment where people are accessing Krishna, whatever is going on. And I feel that's the greatest offering we can offer to Srila Prabhupada. That would be the greater, greatest aspect of compassion. Now to do that, it means also, again, resources and some arrangements. For facilitation. It's just sympathy. That is authentic compassion. But authentic compassion doesn't mean that for me to show compassion towards you, I have to give you a thousand dollars. It means I may only have ten cents, but I'm ready to share with you what I am having, and I honor your existence, and I have power within me, good feelings about myself, good feelings about you, because I am using that power and connecting with you and giving and will get more power because I am not in a state of empowerment. Understand, when we are in a state of empowerment about what we don't have, whatever it may be, we will not be happy. And even when we get something, we still won't be happy. There's always going to be things that are not complete in our life that we don't have maturely. 
but as we're able to have a sense of Krishna consciousness or internal consciousness, then things usually will happen nicely because it will, it will demand from the environment. But what goes on, one will be happy. So we told you, look at yourselves when you were most happy or times when you're greatest happy, greatest experiences of happiness. It doesn't have a whole lot just to do with what is going on outside. It's what is going on within you and what you are picking up from what you think is going on from within others. And so there is great, we'll come back to that in a little while, but there is great, great power in, in such. I want to read something here from, as we look closer, at, uh, at compassion, what it means. Here in the Bhagavatam, one, two, three, uh, Prabhupada writes in first canto, and all respect obeisances unto Sukha, unto the spiritual master of all sages, the Sambiasev, who out of his great compassion for those gross materialists who struggle to cross over the darkest regions of material existence, spoke this most confidential supplement to the cream of Vedic knowledge, after having personally assimilated it by experience. Here again, Sukha, Sukha spoke this after having knowledge, after having assimilated it, after having this in himself, the power, the resource, then he gave this or shared this. So there was uh, development, or there was possession, there was focus with what one is having for oneself or what one has gotten, and now he's sharing, now a giving, authentic compassion. Be aware to sympathize, and really to reach out or extend oneself to do something to make a difference. It means literally having power, resources. And it means being able to direct, give that, to, to share that. We see times when Srila Prabhupada would be concerned about the voice help, he would give a sweater, give his, his charter, you know, to someone. So that is simply just addressing the person's physical body, yes, no. It is addressing the whole person, Realizing that this person needs this for care of their physical body. Uh, the other day I was just thinking. That was, and even this morning, yesterday, um, uh, I, the book dropped a, a little bird, uh, call it, thing for feeding birds. And what, what do you call that? Bird house? Bird, bird feed? And put it, you know, on the porch, the, thing, the institute house. It was, it was David Vati, actually. So yesterday, today, while I was doing some writing on a marathon, I was just looking at the birds and the squirrels coming and feeding. And I was thinking, a little act, a nice act of compassion, seeing all these different colorful birds coming. It's so beautiful, the birds, and they're chirping, they're coming, they're going, they're eating. And the squirrels looking, you know, they found a feast, they're coming, and they're eating. But also thinking, now, they're just living based on what nature, what Krishna is providing. But at the same time, we can provide something to honor, honor, honor their existence. And so, then I start thinking more in terms of how as one is compassionate, one honors all life. And I've been trying to be in a reflection and meditation of accessing more genuine spiritual shakti, for lack of a better word. And realizing how that's so much connected with letting Krishna come through. How that's, how that's so much associated with literally with be, becoming, becoming more compassionate, becoming more loving. And so then I start thinking, how often we get angry or disturbed or fearful, we see some entities. But we also have to be more compassionate toward all forms. Humans, animals, insects, etc. Because the more that we're compassionate everywhere, to everyone, the more that comes to us. And the more we are absorbed in it, the more we share it. And so I've been doing something this week and I've been like intimidated. Last week I sent out an email message to about 20 of the leaders or so. And in that message I tried to pinpoint leaders who I consider, with my own lack of perception, or perhaps perception, that I consider to be visionaries in our society. And so I sent the letter suggesting so much we put energy to active stuff 
necessary. But at the end of the day, we're just putting out one crisis after another, and we're exhausted, and the people around us are exhausted, and uh, the problems continue in many cases. And so my major point was that there are some problems that will never go away, perhaps, and some problems that will only go away as we have more good things happening, we will naturally eradicate, absorb, replace the negative things. Another thing I would suggest is less form more of a think tank to bring more facilitation to helping the movement. Now looking at resources, looking at also outreach, so many things that can help our society, help us internally, as well as help us in the second world. And then one body wrote a real nice letter about oh, a wonderful idea, uh, Judah Karma. And his point was, let's start a Krishna or ISKCON academy. Now understand academy, academy is not something that dictates policy. Because one of the reasons some of these leaders are rather powerful in what they do is because they don't get bogged down in bureaucracy. And so therefore, they are not waiting for things to happen, but making some things happen. And so for most of us, the last thing they're thinking about is another conference, an email or a physical conference, another committee, another group of people to just talk. Huh? And so, once the people are contacting, there are people who probably less, were less likely to be excited about the idea because they see it as just another, another arrangement for energy and discussions and perhaps nothing to happen. And so, my concern was we must get more synergy in the movement. We have so many powerful, both team powerful leaders. At the same time, we do not work collectively or complement each other sufficiently. And you know, in the letter, you know, to a certain extent. But I also realize that this is going to be difficult because we're still talking about ideas. And then it dawned on me that two things. First, I said that. As, we, as we're reflecting on this, even if most of us agree it should happen, let us agree that let us start looking out around us and notice how many leaders we have made who can do what do. So even if we're not interested in the idea of ourselves coming together and we're into our own sovereignty, which is no problem, some people will bet that way, then let's still look at what we're doing within our own areas, with our own disciples, our own projects, or whatever, that we look out and see how many people we have made who do we do even better. Let's see how we, as leaders, make us leaders, even if it's in our own environment. And then, later I got even a deeper reflection, I think. Now, this is still being processed. We'll see where it comes. But I got a deeper reflection. And my reflection was, we should always consider how everything is possible and what possibility there is. Thank you for going around these days. <laughs> and realize that even if the second one isn't accepted, there is still so much that can be done. And the idea was, why not you put more energy yourself in seeing how to value, how to glorify, how to encourage, how to compliment, and how to serve others more. So this week I've been having a wonderful experience of doing something. And I'd like all of you as much as possible to, you know, to, to accompany, me on this, on, accompany me on this journey, this exciting journey. What I start realizing is more and more how any one person can make a change for many if they use the little power that they have. So I started just on my own, just whoever's in me, I get almost 200 emails a day, 150 emails. And so I just started, as I'm doing all these things, I'll just, especially when it was a God brother or a God sister, I would especially find a way, whatever the concern was, how to do more than we expected. Oh,